and today we're going to speak a little bit about async in Python and not only about asynchronous, like everything related to this magic of concurrency and parallelism and everything else. A uh, few words about me. My name is Alexander Lazarchuk, or you can call me Sasha, like everybody else. I've been working at SoftServe for 13 years, I think, maybe more. I like lost the count. Um, I used to work on like huge amount of projects and not only the Python project. And uh, uh, I even used to work with the Python 2.4, so I'm that old. Uh, I work with uh, a project related to Internet of Things, the uh, machine learning project, different kind of technology. And only one item that connects all those, like almost all those projects, is possibility in Python to run like different tasks in parallel. Let's call it like this. So the main idea why I <clears throat> uh, the first times created this presentation is this piece of code written by uh, let's just call it developer from customer side uh, that's supposed to be parallel. If you don't see anything wrong with this code, this presentation is for you as well. So the, the biggest problem that you look into this code and it seems like pretty much normal and correct and so on, but there's only one minor thing here that's blocked everything. And it's not real like a scene code in Python. And we are going to speak about this uh, today. So let's start from the beginning. So how many terms about parallel programming you know? Yeah, so uh, also I will ask you to participate in this presentation like as much as you can. So I may ask question, do not hesitate to write answer in the chat. If you shy, you can do like send message privately to me. And I promise I won't tell anybody who exactly asked this question, but please like answer me because uh, your questions, your answers, uh, your involvement will uh, lead the course of this presentation. So, uh, <clears throat> so the basic problem that we have currently in async development in Python that most of the developers don't know the difference between each term, like concurrency, parallelism, multi-threading, uh, async. I will just say async because asynchronous uh, is something like very hard for me to pronounce. So who can answer me what does concurrency? What is, how to say it, like, what do you know about concurrency? What is it? Like, in few words, who can ask for me? So concurrency basically means that uh, we are um, trying to uh, get, uh, get some work done from some sort of pool of uh, available slots, uh, I'd say. I put it like this in, in, in uh, short words. And parallelism is what we would like to achieve uh, in the end to have uh, two, uh, the same jobs be executed uh, in, or, or maybe not the same, but the jobs that might be uh, executed uh, in the same time with different inputs. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, in, in parallelism, we, we would like to have this one uh, to be in place. So how would you judge this? Okay, I got you. So uh, let me rephrase. Imagine you have two tasks, a different tasks with different inputs. You know the input, you don't know the output, which is obvious, and you need to run those tasks. What's the difference between running those tasks concurrently and in parallel? Uh, Alexander? Yeah, it looks to me the difference is between the starts. For the concurrency, they will compete between each other on start. And for the parallelism, they will start uh, like uh, not sequentially, but uh, in parallel. Yeah. 
I so agree. what's the difference? Like, uh, how many executors we have in concurrency and in parallelism? In concurrency, I guess it, there will be one executor, and in parallelism, right. you have uh, n number of Correct. executors, right? Correct. Yeah. Depending so, on cores, then, I said, I said I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. So many amount of cores. Yeah. So concurrency was the first concurrency. Like I know how to say the linguist, but the first was the concurrency, and then everything else. So back those time uh, when we used to have only one core in CPU, and we need to run many tasks kind of at the same time. Only one way to do this, to do so, is to implement this concurrency thing. We always have only one executor, one handler, and many tasks. And only one way to do, uh, to execute them, to like for user to feel like it was uh, uh, executed in parallel, to implement this concurrency. And I I don't really like that uh, that in books or some explanation they have they compete between each other. This not like really correct explanation. Uh, you are not like you are not wrong. It's just that from my point of view, they don't even know about each other. They do not compete between themselves. Everything they do is just to like try to uh, how to say it? Uh, get the attention from the handler like really hard. So it's more like they can, not the competing between like several tasks. It's competing for something, for the execution time, for for being noticed. Let's call it like this. And the main problem here, I believe, uh, complete here means, yeah, attention, right? Attention of the executor. So uh, and the main cool thing here that when you see concurrency and parallelism, you you, you might think like it's concurrency or parallelism, but we'll speak about this a bit later. So uh, what kind of problem we try to solve here? Yeah, so uh, problem number one, it's a problem of five great minds that want to eat and they, they always like block each other with this fork problem. Uh, who, who doesn't know about the like five uh, great minds problem? like on the picture. I assume everybody or nobody, never know. So imagine we have five plates of like ramen uh, and five people then that, that, that want to eat and only five forks. There is a limitation. You may start, you can start eat only when you, you're using your left hand, take the left fork, uh, we just like I'm start thinking this is the bad example because mm -hmm. why do you need two forks to eat? But forget about this. It's just a like imagine problem. And then you need to take with your right hand right fork. Yeah, and then you can start eating. And then imagine that at the same time all five great minds took the left fork. And the, another limitation, you cannot put your left fork, fork back on the table. You need to complete your task because you already started. We call this problem deadlock. Like everybody, all executor blocks each other. This is the first problem that uh, could be resolved with this like cool parallel, pro uh, parallel programming uh, stuff. And I think I need to change this picture, but I forgot, sorry. So, but uh, the, the picture on the screen is the uh, illustration of a session of, how to say it, in session of parallel chess game, when one chess master plays uh, with many people. And, like in regular world, when we start match, start session, we need to finish the session, right? And then go to another person. So, and this chess game, I like the most this example because 
uh, it illustrates the idle time. So when you make your move, you need to wait for your opponent to make his or her move, right? And you wait, you wait those seconds, minutes, minute and a half. So you wait, you, you do like, do not do anything. You do nothing, which is the problem because rest of the players wait, so like wait as well. So what can you do is to implement this concurrency thing. You make your move and you click the button that this is the uh, your opponent move and go to the next person and do the same the same the same the same first round of uh, of, of like of uh, tasks you go one by one and then every next task will be executed by uh, request or ad hoc when someone makes the move uh that person notifies you that he or she's ready <clears throat> so this is the best example and one more example is mcdonald's i think i think everybody knows about mcdonald's so when you uh go to the cashier and make your uh, uh order for the food you don't wait yeah uh, until you get your order you go uh, like go somewhere else with the check with your number on it and just wait. And this is also a great example of uh, this kind of kind of parallel because the one person is like concurrency plus parallelism because the waiter uh, uh, takes the order from one person, then from another person, from the second person, and we have a kitchen that make the order in the same place and the order like again at the same time kitchen could have like five orders and each order will have like a couple dishes yeah and the kitchen could like okay these three orders have uh, one burger so i could make three burgers it take less time and then another order like five uh, french fries so which is basically belgian fries but anyway French fries. So I could make five uh, five portions of French fries at the same time, and so on and so on. So this is a great example of implementation in the real world. What I'm trying to, to say with this example that anything, like completely anything in programming world is not something that like exists only in programming world. Like everything you can, uh, everything you work with could be reflected in the real world. You could find an example of any solution, any approach in real world. Yeah. So uh, it's not like event loop, like kitchen itself event loop. The event loop in this case would be the system that McDonald's works with. Yeah, because the computer at the waiter's desk connected to the same network as the computer at the kitchen and the con uh, computer at the uh, administrator's desk and the same work in the same loop. And the loop decides uh, what's next, like take the order, go to the kitchen, notify administration administrator if something goes wrong. Yeah, so kitchen is not an event loop. Event loop is just entire system. Kitchen is just an executor in parallel. Yeah, so we have two cores uh, like or more, one core to take an order, one core to make an order. And the loop decides like this kind of uh, task go to this core and this kind of task go to this core. It could not be implemented in Python, but could be implemented in other systems. But anyway. Uh, uh, that's not mm -hmm. true. <laughs> that's not true. At least from Python 3.12, I guess. Uh, okay. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so, guilty. So, guilty. So, so that's tense, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry for this elaboration. Yeah, that's true. So even in Python uh, 3.9, we have these spawn processes that we could correct, like uh, uh, communicate with the process that every process works in a different uh, in a different core, because this is the rule and I could communicate with, with each process separately. But again, it's not like you really 
address to the core, you address to the handler, but you don't know like how operational system manage this. Okay, so from the Python, you cannot ask core number six to execute this task. You could ask uh, this process execute this task, and you don't know where this process exists or live. It could be the same core or another core. Do you agree with this? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I I, I was just referring to, uh, yeah. to to this new feature that uh, Python community agreed to probably implement. I mean, they will just uh, uh, they will just uh, disable this GIL uh, restriction in uh, in uh, probably in near future, I guess. From so from Python uh, three point twelve, uh, there will be two branches uh, available. Uh, where one branch will be uh, like uh, maintained uh, with the GIL um, present and the second branch will be with no GIL and they will just try to test whether this one is uh, actually uh, supposed to work in the end because we know how uh, at least uh, CPython is uh, taking uh, care uh, about the uh, threading problem, right? So the, I, I would... Right, speak with it. I agree. I agree with. I agree with uh, what you said. Uh, for for this particular moment, it's all uh, uh, as you as you said uh, in, in in particular. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll speak about Jill a bit later. Like, patient, please. So a uh, few words about concurrency. So concurrency manage the few control flows, which means that you could have like several tasks. Only one thing that we didn't mention here that how tasks could compete compete for the intention if the task is some kind of whole thing, like task mean uh, something. And, and if you remember the McDonald's, task would be uh, oh, I forgot this word in English. Uh, Okay, the single task would be work with the client. Yeah, from the uh, moment client uh, walk in uh, McDonald's till the client walk, walks out. Yeah, so this is one task. And one major thing, one major requirements for the concurrency is the task could be splitted by subtasks. Yeah, so. Uh, each flow gets some time to for execution. Yeah, so get the intention. Then can be partially executed per single call. This is the main requirement. So each task could be partially executed. Yeah, so you, in Python, it's pretty easy to understand because we work with the generators like since the beginning of the, of the time. But anyway, for other languages, this is something that very hard to implement like most of the time. And the same, if we have a couple tasks, we have one, two, three, and it could be ended in the different order. Let's speak about these like in different ways. So imagine we have five tasks, four tasks, sorry, and the execution time of this task, like 110 seconds, yeah? And if we run the task one by one, and we have tasks with a different length. So for example, task number one, took 50 seconds to execute it. Task number two, uh, 30 seconds more, and so on and so on. And imagine the smallest task will be executed at the end, which is not fair for the small task. So concurrency allows us to, first of all, rule number three, task could be partially executed. So what we do, we execute task number one, edit. Then we do the same for the task number two. Then we do the same for the task number three, task number four. And as you see on the screen, instead of being executed at the end of the loop, we task number four will be executed at the beginning and do not block anyone. And nobody blocks task number four. And the same and the same and the same. And as you see, different tasks will be executed in different time. So the gray and green, the same. The same for the green. Yeah, so gray on the first screen. I, I, Okay, I need to like fix this plot. So task number three, three executed. 
pre-loss, yeah, 100 seconds to wait. And the concurrency task number three executed like 30 seconds earlier. Again, this is just a like visualization in real world you have not for but 400 tasks. And imagine how much time it would take to execute some small tasks compared to the big tasks if they all in the same loop, in the same order. So this is all about concurrency. The main problem of concurrency, uh, uh, the main uh, issue that concurrency solves is the execute small task compared to the big task using chunks, much profitable than execute them one by one, waiting for the one task to execute the first and then second and then second. Again, we don't speak about input output operation. We don't speak about Jill at all. It's a completely separate uh, situation. So <clears throat> what we have now, we have concurrency that allow us to split this one. The next one would be parallelism. When uh, like, more law uh, and uh, technology rises, we currently could have like 32, even partially virtual, but still cores, which is mean we could do some tasks in parallel. It means that if we have the same amount of tasks and we could run each task in the separate core. But if we add the concurrency here and split each task for the smallest task and take into account that we have many cores, imagine that we could split the pool of 100 tasks to two small pools by 50 tasks and execute each sub pool in separate core. And concurrency is, is still here. So parallelism is just about execution on the separate handlers and that's all so again we don't speak about input output we don't speak about speak about threads we speak about the concurrency in single core and parallelism in many cores and they could live together yeah so they could live together you could run like 50 tasks in one core using uh, concurrency and then the same with the, another pool of 50 tasks and in the another call. So what the uh, why everybody hates Gil or Jill correct way would be Jill so much. Uh, could somebody explain me why do you hate Jill? or at least why Python community hates Jill and uh, all the time tries to remove it from the Python. Why we have Jill in the first place in Python? Um, so if we, are if we are talking about C Python, this is basically uh, the legacy from the C language itself because C language has uh, the limitation, which is basically uh, also present in, uh, in Python as well. So that's, so, so from the perspective of Python, that is, for instance, uh, implemented in Java, there is no such thing as uh, GIL. So uh, this is mainly the legacy from the C language, which uh, does not actually uh, allow uh, to do the parallel parallelism in, uh, like, like, let's say, a gentle way, right? Mm, okay, uh, Alexander, your uh... yeah. Um, so the main problem is uh, how Jill ensures the thread safety in C Python. Yeah, it's an, uh, allowing only one running thread at a time to execute Python bytecode, and because of this mem memory management system, because sorry, because Python management uh, memory systems are not thread safe, uh, Jill is used to serialize access to those objects mm -hmm. uh, and. Mm -hmm memory to prevent race conditions. And this means that uh, we don't have actual free concurrency because still our threads are running one by one, started one by one. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, you both right in like, uh, if somebody else could add something, it would be great because you all just add in. Oh, hi, Aaron. Hey, well, hey, yeah, yeah, <laughs> true, true, true. Um, 
I'm glad to hear this holy war right here, right now. It's really great to hear it. I just want to add a small thing that more than 20 years ago, Guido Van Rossen tried to disable Gil, and they did a lot of optimization to make it work, but unfortunately, the performance overall was really bad. I think it was Python 1.5, I guess. So it's, yeah, it was really, really long story back. We used but... to have narrow builds of Python, uh, like version 2.5 even. And yeah, it was yeah. horrible, horribly underperformed applications. But yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no worries. That's only one I wanted to add. But, mm -hmm. but yeah. now, I actually didn't know as you that uh, I guess they already have a fork starting from CPython 3.11 where they will try to disable GIL. And looks like according to their discussion, their performance, if you will compare with the main branch, will be fine, at least as it is. So it's great to hear it. But to be honest, from my experience, I didn't have any problems working with GIL, right? Mm -hmm. If you understand yeah. how to separate your workloads and yeah. you will never have any problems. So yeah, that's so, all I want to say. And great, uh, great presentation, by the way, Alexander, but I guess I heard it somewhere. <laughs> uh, the first question, this like, I improve this presentation all the time. So uh, yeah, correct. Uh, so First of all, the Python community has the good tradition, good ceremony once like gather once per uh, 10 years and disable Jill. Uh, I think this is the like this third generation of the Python community that tries to disable Jill in three point something. So the main problem of Jill is running uh it does not prevent you from executing one core at the time it prevents you from execute one core uh like uh, one core at the time at one uh process yeah uh so it means that in python with gil enabled which is basically mutex like if you know what the difference between log and mutex uh basically mutex that prevents you from running Python application on many cores at the same time for one process, which is allowed for the system. But Python do not allow you to do this. What does it mean? It means that if you have some piece of code inside your Python, some calculation, great math calculation, and you need to split the uh, equal parts of calculation, like calculating the logarithm from like crazy numbers or calculating the prime numbers, so, for example, you want to split your calculation by five chunks using the different ranges, and you want to execute them in different cores. Jill do not allow you to do this only because, as Alexander says, uh, it prevents you from assessing memory. So it does not allow you to share the memory. Uh, and the other hand, in programming world, we have uh, POSIX IPC, interprocess communication, which allows you to create one more process of Python and using pipes, messages, events, anything else, synchronize them. So you could run some process in Python starting from uh, 3.9 or 3.8, you could spawn the process and share some piece of shared memory between Python processes. And it always allows you to do these. But in order to do so, you need to create one more process manually and then pray that that process will be executed in another core. So this is another problem. So basically, Jill, only one thing that Jill blocks you is from executing some CPU inbound operation on many cores. What does a CPU inbound operation mean? Everything you calculate, everything like some mass that your CPU uh, needs to take part on, needs to handle. So this is the main app item. And since the beginning of the time, the, there is another, like since the beginning of computing, there are two kinds of operations we have. It's a CPU bound and input output bound operation. We are going to speak about it a bit later. So just remember the GIL problem, the GIL itself just do not allow you to execute the the, the Python piece of work from your process in another core, only because Python itself inside the own 
interpre interpreter could not synchronize this thing and it might lead to some data leaks or deadlocks, race condition, like different kind of problems you don't really want to face with. So yeah, everything in Python runs in the main thread. Again, the main present, the main topic of this presentation is async and async runs in the main thread as well. But again, we're going to do this later. So one core, one, uh, one thread at a time and like all that kind of stuff. But again, we have input output operation. What's the difference between CPU bound and input output bound operation? CPU bound, this is something that executed mainly in your CPU inside your process. Input output operation, this is something you could delegate. And this is all about asynchronous, all about async. Async is about delegating. You ask somebody to do this. You ask your uh, operational system to open file. You ask your operational system driver to create a socket for internet connection. You ask your operational system driver for DB connection to open DB connection and to perform something. And if you go back to the chess game, this is the real concurrency multi, uh, multi like concurrency async uh, programming because you make the move and you delegate of making, you, you all the time you make the move, it means you start the process with the inputs and wait this another process to handle the situation and give you the response. And this idle time, the best process required to process everything and give you a result, you could spend to do something else. And Python used to have these all the time. And the threads in Python works perfectly well with this input output operation. All the time you work with the request sockets, uh, connection, all except files, uh, but different kind of pipes, everything, all that stuff works well with the Python in threads with only one problem with threads of themselves that I'm going to explain later. So Jill is the real problem if you work with the pandas, some heavy math calculations and so on and so on, everything related to CPU and that's all. Jill like, do not, does not block you anyway if you work with some like request to server, request to database and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. It might, if you want, if you use the request, in this case you use threads and operation system allows you to do this. Operation system will ask Jill to release the log for this part of code because nobody uses this except the separate process that I will notify you when the process is complete. And then the Python goes to another thread for the another piece of code and execute them until the, the piece of code that requires another request to input output or something. Is it like, uh, well defined for you, like I might explain in different words, or I could continue if you like don't have any questions. Okay, time is over. Go next. Uh, concurrency versus parallelism. What should I choose? Will we use both? I already told this. This is how it's look in the in my imagination. So that's fine. So. Uh, like threads for execution and concurrency for splitting. So that's fine. And uh, separate, uh, separate uh, like a couple of words about threads. Uh, I heard the rumors, the myth uh, that Python doesn't have real threads. I, I like, for some reason, it's still the case that somebody told me that Python doesn't have real threads. And I was like, what the thread is? Yeah, so if you don't know, Thread is object that lives in the operational system. This is something you need to remember. Threads could be only thread could be only created on the operational system side, and operational system wants to manage the, uh, the thread, each thread. Yeah, and the biggest problem that we have in Python. Before async, before async, you're in 
that thread itself very huge object with big amount of metadata. And when you have big amount of threads, the operational system in some case, in some time starts spending a lot of time just to switch in the context between thread, then executing the thread himself. And this is the problem that Ivan just described that we used to have in Python 2, in Python 1, that when Jill is uh, released, and Python allows to do the many parallel execution with like bad approach for for this multi multi threading stuff. Operational system will spend a lot of time just to switch in context, and context is just a piece of memory that each thread saves. Uh, like each thread has access from the process. Let's call it like this. And operational system takes too much time to switch between threads than to execute them. And imagine if you have five threads and to switch the context, you spend well, like one milliseconds to execute five milliseconds. If you have 100, you spend like five milliseconds to exit, to switch the context and less than a milliseconds to egg. Like you, it's left less than a millisecond to execute the thread. So that's why performance getting worse. Uh, no, but what is between bad and worst? The second form, I forgot. Worse, 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 worser, worse. I know, sorry, my English is bad. I used to learn French. Okay, so uh, this is main difference between like the concurrency and trading and the jill problem, which is not actually a problem if you don't work with a uh, with uh, some heavy calculation, but be honest, like almost everybody here on this call in Python works with open API. Correct me if I'm wrong. Nobody corrects me. So I think I'm right. At least most of you works with the APIs, write in APIs and do not work with uh, like some machine learning problem or data, uh, data digging and that kind of stuff that actually requires some a lot of uh, execution time and uh, capacity. So then we have to multiprocessing, which is like the pain in the known places. So multiprocess uh, when you run the one process in the like in one core or separate process in uh, like the same core, but anyway, one process at a time, and you could execute one chunk of data in this process. So again, if you want to really multi-process stuff, uh, like parallel the, the uh, in Python, in starting from 3.8, if I'm not mistaken, you could spawn many sub-processes of Python and ask them to do the, the one chunk of work. And then using IPC synchronization, like five messages, event, everything else that you should know about, Already, but anyway, uh, you could gather this information and combine in the main process. And the like cool thing about these kind of sub processes that it shares some chunk of main process memory. Heap, it's called heap. And uh, just to remind you, if somebody forgot, the process has the memory heap, and threads does not. And only one way for threads to execute something is to access memory of the process. And if you have sub process or that like fork, if you work with Python with process, you should know about fork as well. It, it creates copy of the memory heap. And it means that if you want to sync them, you need to somehow uh, notify one, like each one should notify another one about any change in the memory. Uh, using some APC. Uh, if you work with a message broker, you should know about this kind of stuff. Uh, also, if you ever work with a console with some connections, you might saw this broken uh, like connection reset by peer or broken pipe or stuff like this. So this is all messages from the uh, synchronization way, synchronization method. 
yeah, when the created in the pipe, which is just a file from the unnamed file in the socket. And again, uh, if you really want to just in me, if, if you really want to know uh, more about this part of uh, parallel programming, just ping me in Teams and I will give you some literature on this. So multiprocessing is good, but very hard to manage. It's like almost impossible to manage. Uh, what should I choose here? It's like, if you don't need to sync some chunk of work uh, and you could execute different, completely different things, you could use multi-process, then this thing, uh, if you work with the input output operation, you could uh, run that in parallel, like execute 10 requests at the same time because operation system will manage all the requests separately and you will just need to wait. You just need to wait for the results. And the concurrency, this is something that uh, operation system already has implemented and for you is just to implement it well, implement this partial execution stuff. <clears throat> Copy, spam, spawn, any different way of uh, ma process management. Uh, in Python, uh, how to do it in Python? So if you work with the async, you may saw this uh, thread pool executor and maybe process pool executor. So basically this is it. Process pool executor allows you to uh, execute something in different processes, uh, thread pool in different threads. Yeah, so that, that kind of uh, stuff. And process pool will create many processes. Uh, if you work with the unicorn, unicorn, uvicorn, uv, vm, and that kind of uv, uv, gumi stuff, uh, you might notice that uh, threads or processes flag or inside some variables. And uh, if you go to the processes, you will see that under the process of Uricorn, you will find like five, 10, eight processes of Python. So each process is a separate instance of your server, your API, and the server manage which process received their request for process. So this is like, uh, real-time multi-process programming uh, that you may see in the uh, in the Python world. So async. Uh, what is async? Yeah, I will show you some old examples. Uh, yeah, so this is what is async. Do you see? Do you see it well? White on the black. Uh, so if you see on the screen, you will not find anything related to async, yeah, because this is just a concurrency. So I have two tasks. The main uh, purpose of this task to calculate the uh, uh, arithmetical progression and the like geometrical progression. And what do you see here? If I run this queue generator, I will find that each task will be like executed one by one, like one part, then another part, then second part, then third part, and so on and so on. So this is an example of how concurrency really work. Yeah, the task number one executes partially and then give the uh possibility to be executed for the another task and in order to do so i need to have a queue and i need to have a loop yeah so i think you already taken the like the clue how everything works and so i have it and you need to have a generator right uh generator is just a, a way of splitting tasks mm -hmm. this is the python like the, the, the reason why we have async, because we get this generator for free. <laughs> we already have it. And it was it has not been designed for, to like to be coroutine, basically subroutine. It's not designed to do to, to be this, but a couple people, one of them uh, from Ukraine, noticed this and was like, okay, I can do this. We can use this one. We already have it. We already have the main requirements for this. I think programming, the partial execution. 
and they just reuse them them and if you remember the first part of part of code i uh, shown you they were not uh, any anything can await it was decorator uh it was those days that like we have to install a sync using pip so the main idea here is like generator just allow you to execute it partially in the nutshell generators were a cool function that allows you to sync like to stop to pose the frame stack and keep the memory it's like it works in the same way as the context for the threads but in much simpler way that you post the execution in the stack and then go to another one like you have this execution stack uh points to the uh, to the stack somewhere and then when you execute another function you could go back to this generator and execute from the same time that you left that function is so basically uh each execution uh, all the time you execute thread uh, execute generator you execute one function and then when you execute generator from another way from another step another iteration you execute one more function but in python it was implemented in really cool way that allows you to use it as like as is so this is just an illustration how concurrency works and then what we can do we could find the operation input output operation that allows me to split the work and show you that different tasks will, tasks will be executed in different order so i can i think this one would be the best yeah so uh what we have here oh no 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 i think request this one so we have get data which is a sync function but all requests we have here is blocking which is mean like unless we get the response from the request we cannot go further but this one the same but allowed me to do two things first execute get like http connection and execute uh stream get so imagine why do we have this one await here is the response could be the file that lives in operational system or response could be the data in another server that you need to access so that's why when you use like, any kind of kind of input operation operation that returns you something it's not always the just a plain text it could be the link to the like file handler stream io and everything else so it's like recommended to use async for the getting data from the response as well so when i when i run this i have several tasks and as you see the order is like almost random i run like remember i said like when you run the first time you run everything in like in in the order from zero to last one but from the first step, first task that executed will be executed first. Yeah, so this is something like really, really cool. And okay, we know about generator. Generator allows us to execute tasks partially, which is requirement for the concurrency. And the async await, which is just a core routine, which is not exactly the core routine. The in modern Python world, they call it awaitable function because it's not real coroutine uh, and the one thing that awaitable function does release the lock how remember i told you that real async is to delegate in the control so all the time you perform input output operation you ask operational system operation system to do this only os could manage the input output operation yeah uh because all the time you do something with the e uh, io means you need to ask the driver to do this and only operate op os know about the drivers and know how to like work with them so when you ask uh, request get you open socket like it could be berkeley socket it could be different realization of any kind of socket but internet socket 
you ask to open the socket. And in this way, when you open the socket in the chess game, you make your move and click the timer. And then in blocking world you, world, you wait. You wait until the operation system gives you the response from this driver. But in the async world, Jill, which is like uh, basically blocks you from doing anything here, could be asked to release the lock from this place because nobody could do anything with this chunk of uh, code because it's executed in another process. So async, async IO and everything that uh, like inherit, inherit all that behavior, just ask Jill release, release uh, lock and let me do different stuff. And this is it. This is all magic of async. It just allow you to delegate input output operation and the async IO is just a loop while through something. It's just a queue. We're going to speak about queue later. And it's just a task, which is promise, which is like dispatch, which is like many other feature, feature or, or, or feature or task or anything else. And it will just allow to wait for the result. Again, let's go through the McDonald's. When you make your order, you get the, like uh, the number of your order and you have a monitor that you could check what the uh, percentage of readiness for your order. Yeah, so you, you, you could see like, okay, my burger is done and my call is like, my coffee is done. So in McDonald's, you can even take the partial results if you know. In Python, you could do this as well. You don't need to wait like all results of your process. You could get partial results from the, from the execution. And this is also a cool feature for, uh, from the uh, generators because generator allows you to execute step, return the result, and even take some more results as an input in the middle of execution. So this is main like main cool things about async that it allows you to do like everything like one by one but partial. Uh, one more example I want to show you that yeah. So this is the question to you when I ask, can you tell me what the order of execution will be in this case? Task one, task two, task three, and task four. I have event loop, I have run forever, I have two tasks, callback and callback two. What the order will be here? I guess the way you submit it. It's just uh, like range to 11 each all the time and sleep. Basically sleep is input output operation. You ask CPU clock to like wait. Yeah, I mean, it will be executed uh, the way you submitted them. So kind of should be task one, task two, task three, to task four. But again, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the implementation there. So they will be switching, I guess, on the go since you have the I think I used it. Okay, uh, one, three, two, four. Are there uh, options? Okay, yeah, so correct answer is one, three, two, four. And this is the most unobvious thing in async that like a lot of people uh, don't know. And when you submit two tasks, each task will be executed, as you know, partially, but await it just a yield. And all the time you work with a uh, awaitable function, you need to remember that you work, work with a simple generator. And when you have two yields in generator, which is yield from basically. You cannot skip this yield and go to this yield unless this yield is fully exhausted. You know? So when you create two tasks, callback and callback two, and each task has two awaits, like which is 
two more awaitable functions, remember that async IO will run the first yield here and first, first yield here. Then when first task is over, it will go to the second task. So when we run it, you will see one, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, then steps, and then two, four, two, four, two, four. Again, you don't need to think about async as something like magical, magical beast that you have no idea about. It's just a like regular generator that knows how to release the log. And you don't need to know how, <laughs> how does it know? Like you need to believe in this. Like uh, if you know where Hammer 440,000 uh, works, uh, technology works when you believe in it. Here is the same case, the async IO works when you believe in it. So remember you work with the simple generator. Another example, I have mm, oh, this one pretty much obvious. Yeah, producer consumer model. And this one uh, will illustrate how the queue works here. So we are going to speak about queue a bit and then go back to this example. Uh, oh, uh, bottlenecks, regular thing. So async works with the only async. Yeah, so if async, uh, if you run something asynchronously, I've already shown you in the OS request. Uh, when you try to uh, uh, execute blocking, library, it will be blocked. It will be blocked. Like execution will be blocked. You could use some monkey patching, green threads, and everything else, but I do not recommend this. And uh, also heavy task uh, also is not really recommended to implement because uh, it's very hard to keep in the memory all that all the steps. So try to yeah like like uh, give the small portion of data all the time you execute the part. Um, in in WGI, it's all it's almost not a problem right now because we have HGI which allow you to uh, implement this uh, async in requests in uh, gateway interface. Django, if you work with Django, you know Django channels, great thing. Implement web sockets, great thing. But if you need to have async view, it's almost impossible to do. You need to like. There are a lot of hacks. It's much simpler in the latest version of Django, but you work with Django, you know that like almost nobody uses the latest version of Django. It's always like 2.4 or later, or maybe something like new one. But anyway, so there are some bottlenecks. And uh, when you use time sleep, subprocess, socket, like all those libraries with the threads, threads know how to deal with this. Thread knows that this is input output uh, because thread is managed by operational system. So operational operation system just communicates with the Python and says, okay, this one on me, go, go to the next place. And then Python switch, release the GIL and goes to another piece of code. Uh, in async, async manage the process. So async loop, event loop manages the uh, all execution within the Python itself operational system, operation system doesn't have access to this, yeah? Because everything executed in async loop, executed in single thread in Python. So, uh, yeah, event loop, uh, don't really want to bother to show like how it works. So basically event loop is just a while true. I, I show you, it, it's not like a real while true, but anyway. So, uh, code example, uh, producer consumer model, model, you have event loop and all the time you add task, create task, you add this task to some like, uh, because it's implemented in C already, I forgot. So you add this task into some internal queue. So loop, remember, loop is just about execution. Loop queue, it's about the, uh, storing and giving the, the data. So, okay, 33, okay, I have that. So 
there are two kinds of queues. Yeah, uh, there is the sync queue and async queue. Sync queue, only one difference between those kind of queues. When you get the data from the sync queue and queue is empty, you get an error. When you put the data into queue and queue is full, you get an error. When you get the size of the queue, you get the size like as is. Uh, when you ask, is it empty? It returns you, is it empty or not? Mm -hmm. The async queue, so I use the uh, async your queue, but there is many, many different queues you could find. When you put something in the async queue, uh, you could wait. So async, when you put something in queue and it checks, OK, the queue is full, like I might wait. I could do it manually. I could do it like the queue itself could manage this one. It has timeout. So when you put something into full queue, uh, you will you will not get an error unless the timeout is uh, run out, and the the queue manager will will like okay. I will wait five seconds. If somebody pull the uh, data from the queue, and I will be free to put new item inside the queue. And this is only one difference. And it works in this way. So queue is empty waiting, adding item. There's something could be queue is full or not. Yeah, so this is producer consumer model. model. I have producer, I have two consumers. Oh yeah, queue is full waiting. Uh, producer will put new task in the queue and consumers will get the data from the queue and try to process them, and that's all. And this is the main main idea of any async operation that you are going to work with, including the uh, servers, because you are going to produce tasks and somebody needs to consume these uh, message brokering and uh, different kinds of events. That's all the producer consumer model in one or another way you are going to work with in Python. Again, the great ex like the, the the basic basic example of this. Uh, again, if you have any question, don't hesitate. Ask them now. Or wait until later. A quick question: uh, Does it switch the context uh, if Q is not full? It doesn't switch context at all. What do you mean by switching context? Because context, this is something that a thread has access to inside the OS. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I mean, like uh, giving uh, the possibility. Yeah, for it's another... a way. Yeah, uh, it's go so, to another task. So even if Q is not full, it is still giving a possibility for other tasks to run. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Again, it's dep it depends on realization. It depends on implementation. So uh, there are queues that could work in both ways. Like uh, we used to work with the uh, Janus or Janus, depends on the pronunciation in your country, uh, that allow you to work in the async or sync way. Depends on the, uh, your implementation. Uh, also, everybody heard about fast API, right? I will mm -hmm. heard. Yeah, like everybody, do, the, the, everybody that works with the uh, with the open AI or just API, or open API, sorry. So you also may remember that some, in some cases you could define your handler, your endpoint as an async function, but in some cases you could define it as a regular function and you still get the async, how it's possible. So <clears throat> the main, the answer is here. So when you have a handler, handler is just a function that handles your road that you define. It checks, is it async? Uh, is async callable? It's just a function inside the async IO module that check, is, is it coroutine or something? I don't remember. Is it, is coroutine function? Yeah. Uh, it checks, is it coroutine? If yes, we just await this function inside the main loop, inside the, the event loop that we started when we start the starlet. But if it's not, we run it in thread pool. And this is the case when 
you create partial, you use any IO and like run this function, the, the blocking function inside the separate thread, inside the async loop. And this thread will be sub thread of main, main thread and loop will be able to switch to this function. And as you see, it's partial. Uh, uh, means that we kind of run this, like we create the arrow function, like or lambda function without input parameters that will run this function with the parameters. So what we do here, we run kind of sync, like blocking function inside the, the thread pool inside the loop. And it means that if we have one function with awaits inside and second function without, but with input output operations, yeah, the loop will understand, okay, I will execute this function until the await and then switch to thing, this blocking function. But since it run in the thread, operation system will notify me that there was input output operation. It means I need to stop here and release the log and release the context, release the lock and release the executor. And then the loop will switch back to the first function and starts from the await. And this is how, uh, how you could implement the uh, combined mechanism of async and threading. Okay, any questions here? That, that's, uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. I need, 15 more minutes. Yeah, Anton, sorry. Okay. I just uh, had a quick, quick question. Why do we need partial here? Uh, okay, so what is, uh, like, when you run handler, yeah, when you run function, you need to run function with attributes, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have function, you have attributes, but you don't need, you don't want to run it right now. Yeah, you need to create the function that will run your function with the parameters. Mm -hmm. So you create this partial, run sync doesn't accept keywords, as you see, so it only accept like uh, regular arguments. It means that you create the function that will, will be executed with your keyword arguments. And then when run sync execute your handler, your function, it will pass the uh, arbitrary arguments. That's we have this only because of the limitation of run sync, and that's all. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm just asking because we already have a function, right? So we could just pass it down. Uh, but anyways, okay, it's just some specific. Okay. Basically, we could, we could do like this. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, they decide to like Starlet developers decided to like do in this way. I have no idea why, but anyway, maybe some restriction of partial, maybe like no reason at all, so. Okay, and one more example about loops I want to show you that, that I have. So I have a like regular server that implements uh, TCP IP, like async your protocol for the asynchronous messages. And I have a chat. And the chat itself implement like uh, oh. So this is the GUI for the chat and yeah, written by PyQT. And the main problem, if you ever work with the GUI in the operation system, you know that Every application has own application loop. 
And all the time, you if you work with the IoT, you also know that about the application loop. So the main problem here, the application go through the loop and ask each component to give the update. And then we know the ISIM is also running in the loop. So what we need to do is somehow synchronize the loops. Yeah, so a separate chat, we have a server, server process all, all connections, server process messages. And like all the time we do something, like we have this, like it's really simple chat. I have like, we implement this on the courses. So by the main idea here is to understand how to work with the loop. So when you have application with own loop and you need to somehow integrate your loop with this application loop, what you can do is async allows you to set, uh, to set the outside loop. Only one item you need to be sure that this loop implements the main loop protocol that uh, async IO works with which is mean that you could integrate your async IO application into another application's loop with no problem at all. And all your tasks inside your loop will be executed in the same loop as the main application. And this is a cool thing. And for example, this is a PyQt application that runs in the own QT loop, but async used the same loop to distribute and to process messages, which is mean that like loop, it's not something that Python have inside. Also, if you work with the async IO deeply, you have this async IO magic something, something package, and you may find UV loop, which is the fastest loop I worked with in the Python like three or four years ago when I last worked with these custom solutions for the async. Again, you could define, you could implement this loop by yourself. You could implement the queue by yourself. You could do all that kind of stuff because async IO by itself is just a, something that runs inside the loop that implements some protocol. Go to the queue, implement some like that implements some protocol. Uh, get the data, run the loop get the data and return the results until complete, call later, call soon, and so on. So uh, read about coroutine, future and task by yourself, but do not, Wikipedia, do not use Wikipedia. Everything that related to Python, please use docpython.org because in Wikipedia, I read gibberish. It's not a real thing at all. The, the ideas of those things was, like created in 70s maybe by two separate two separate uh, authors in separate books with the difference of one year different terms but similar suggestions and like you could go there you you may find what the difference between subroutine and coroutine and why python's coroutine is not like real coroutine and so on and so on uh yeah, so I show you the real examples. The Yen, Janus, Janus, it's like basically Q is just a pipe between consumer and producer. Uh, I showed you an example already, like real cool. Oh, one cool, one more stuff. Sorry, sorry, Elena, sorry. Uh, Async can classes. So, how can you? This is piece of code that somebody like asked me to add because it was like real pain how to make async objects in, on the init. So a uh, couple ways. So you could define async new a async init as you see here. You could create the class method that will create your function and you will do this uh, synchronously, but call as a, like async awaitable function here, like that performs some async stuff. Uh, you could define, uh, yeah, so here, here we uh, create the instance and we call inside the awaitable new, which is constructor, you create instance from super and you await init, init function from your instance and return your instance. That's one way. Another way, the same. You call 
new async and then await new in the same way and you call uh, init uh, like as available. But I would I recommend this option. It's like hard to understand, but anyway, easy to do. And the same, you have the separate async function inside your class and you could do the same, but only one way you need to find this await inside the class. That means you need, you can define, call this class as awaitable and give this, like put this class inside the, uh, inside the loop and you need to define this. And then you could call your init function Awaitable. This is really, 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 really uh, major thing to do if you want to make your class awaitable. Uh, there are many other examples. You know about a uh, enter, a exit, uh, a iter, and so on. So you could call await with with, await with for, and many other things. So it's very easy to find something and the Final word here. So we have threads, we have async, and we have processes. The difference between threads and async coroutines that thread managed by operational system, it's heavy. It's very hard to switch context if you have like 200 or 300 of them. And uh, But the cool thing, it's named. You could access the result of specific thread. Uh, you could control this. You could send the signal inside the thread to do something and uh, you could execute many things you could control the execution in the icing you could not control anything you just say run and give me the result and i don't really want to know anything about that what in the middle and cool thing that you could run uh in parallel many tasks but only one thing you get is just the results, no control inside. In threads, you could run few. So comparing threads could, could be could execute like 500 with no problem, I think thousands. Yeah, but again, in threads, you have a control. In threads, operation, op, uh, or operation system controls this operation system. Operation system controls the execution, context, and everything else. In async, Python managed all that stuff. In processes uh, and threads and async works with the input output operation in Python only. Like if you want to execute CPU bound operation, you won't get parallelism all. In process, you could execute CPU bound operation, which is mean you need to directly split your task by two separate tasks that does not that don't require synchronization between. Because when you start synchronizing the process. Uh, you will end up with a headache, uh, degenerated, uh, bad slab, and so on. So process should be well-defined, well-splitted, executed in separate thread, and then get the result somewhere, somewhere else. Phew, I think that's all. It was like very, uh, uh, I will go to questions. Questions? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, sorry, Alexander. Uh, will you have this presentation somewhere? Uh, I will share it with you. It's on Prezi, uh, it's on internet, so you'll be able to like open it even on the smartphone. Mm, cool. Thank you. It doesn't have the all the full code that I showed you today on the demo. It just had some examples that are free to show, use, and so on. But the chat code, I'm not going to share it with you. Sorry, it's like under the NDA of uh, like I could show it. I could like you could manually type it from the screen, but I cannot share it directly. Like it's intentional. So.